boldly engaging the mindless propaganda of our time, apparently with reason. This is Rage of the Age. This is Rage of the Age, and we have with us a President Emeritus from the Foundation for Economic Education. He is a Humphreys Family Senior Fellow, a former president of the Mackinac Center for Public Policy, and a former economics teacher. I want to introduce to you today, Lawrence W. Reed. Lawrence, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Philip, for having me. I appreciate it. <laughs> the uh, We were just joking about this earlier, but it's humorous how uh, we kind of cross each other's path when <laughs> I saw a uh, documentary on the Magna Carta that you were actually on. And when I mentioned it to you, you had no idea you were even on <laughs> this documentary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I have since uh, watched the whole thing and liked it very much. So I appreciate your <laughs> calling my attention to it. But I don't even remember uh, where and when that was filmed. I'm just happy to have been a part of it. But, but that was you. You confirmed that was you. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was me. <laughs> I mean, originally I was wanting to discuss uh, the Magna Carta and its effects. Um, but today we're actually going to talk about great myths of the Great Depression. And I read the article uh, that you put out on that from the Foundation for Economic Education, and really shocked me a lot because um, I I grew up listening to as you described it in your article the the myths that uh, Hoover was laissez faire hands off economics. As a result, the Great Depression crushed everybody. FDR came and basically saved not only the country but the whole world. You know, <laughs> and uh, and in reading what you wrote about it though, it's kind of a knocks the, the knees under that a little bit. Uh, my, <laughs> my, my grandparents grew up during this time and they basically kind of told me that, that, you know, FDR saved everything. My grandfather was in the uh, CCC, uh, Civilian Construction Corps. And if it was, as far as they're concerned, if it wasn't for that man, our nation wouldn't be existing today. But you have a different take on that, right? Yeah, absolutely. I think to a great extent, certainly among historians anyway, Uh, The interpretation they have of the Great Depression depends more on uh, their personal political agendas and ideologies than it depends upon actual facts. So uh, if you're a left-leaning, socialist-friendly historian, uh, you can't uh, for very long maintain that big government didn't uh, work in the 1920s and 30s, or you look rather silly. So A lot of those biased historians have given us this uh, conventional but unfortunately mistaken perspective that somehow the Depression was uh, caused by capitalism or free markets, the government was an innocent bystander, and then uh, Franklin Roosevelt came in and saved us. I mean, it's utterly ridiculous. And since you've mentioned the essay, uh, this is what you're referring to, Philip, and readers can get that uh, free online, or if they want a hard copy, it's just a few bucks at fee.org. The government was innocent. And and of course, Hoover (laughs) was supposed to be laissez-faire. And I believed this for the longest time because that's just what our historical text in school taught us. I I didn't know better, but he wasn't exactly laissez-faire and hands-off. The government wasn't exactly innocent in this matter, was it? No, it wasn't. As a matter of fact, the seeds of the Great Depression are uh, from the Federal Reserve, the government's central bank. Uh, For about five years in the 1920s, uh, it engineered a very substantial expansion of money and credit. It drove interest rates to historic lows. It fueled uh, things like a land boom in Florida. It was a bubble, a bubble like uh, we had in the U.S. uh, several times in the last century, but most recently, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, right after, right before the uh, collapse of 2008. Uh, And so when the Federal Reserve created that bubble, For a temporary period, you had uh, the roaring 20s and lots of economic activity with these dirt cheap interest rates. But then later, the Fed reversed itself and dramatically raised those interest rates, which choked Mm -hmm. off the growth and brought about the the stock market collapse in the fall of 29, followed by a very deep uh, recession, then depression. I'm trying to piece these things together. Is is that because of uh, what was called Keynesian uh, economic thought at the time to flood that mar- that money into the market to kickstart it? 
Well, Keynes, John Maynard Keynes, for whom Keynesian economics is named, he was certainly around. He'd been writing and had made a name for himself from uh, the late teens, 19 teens uh, and on. But his pathbreaking book, uh, uh, The General Theory, uh, in which he expounded all these ideas of uh, monetary or fiscal stimulus uh, by the government and so forth, running right. deficits to stimulate the economy, that kind of stuff. That didn't come until 1936. Okay. Uh, so what the Fed was doing was, uh, to some extent, sort of uh, uh, prefacing uh, Keynes, who would later make this a uh, philosophy <laughs> of economics uh, okay. a few years later. Right. But he comes later. All right. So, and, and Hoover himself, again, had been for a long, and, and I believe, I believe that I think until I read your, your essay on it, uh, just, yeah, I've never been challenged on that thought before, but you're saying he wasn't laissez-faire, that he was intervening in the economy. Oh, he sure was. And you don't have to take my word for it, although I'll be happy in a moment to give you some of those details. But uh, Franklin Roosevelt, when he ran against Hoover in the 1932 election, uh, he attacked Hoover for, and this is in his words, presiding over the greatest taxing and spending administration in peacetime history. Right. And uh, his running mate, John Nance Garner, attacked Hoover for leading the country down the path to socialism. Well, they were right, even though once they took office uh, after Hoover, they pretty much did the same thing on steroids. But uh, <laughs> Hoover, had, uh, <laughs> Hoover had his own subsidy scheme, his Reconstruction Finance Corporation. He doubled the income tax. He jacked up tariffs uh, to an all-time high and virtually choked off international trade. I mean, he was no laissez-faire, hands-off uh, president. And any historian who claims that is either uninformed or trying to misinform you. Well, that's that's what's got me scratching my head because you present the obvious facts in your essay, and I don't think they're you, you can't dispute them. Really, they are what they are. And why is that then still taught in history books as the case if we know that is not the case? Well, because most history books are written by people who are biased toward big government. And if they say, well, I want big government, but guess what? It failed under Hoover. And right. actually, when, when Roosevelt gave us even more big government, he prolonged the Depression by another seven years. Well, that raises questions about why they're for big government. <laughs> so yes. uh, unfortunately, there's this ideological bias through which they view that period. And it's very unfortunate. If they simply looked at the facts, they'd have to realize that uh, Hoover wasn't sitting on his fanny. Roosevelt uh, plainly made it evident that uh, Hoover was all over the place, all over the economy. And then Roosevelt did it uh, even more, and the result was disaster. And that's another thing that catches me off guard, too, is um, I did not know that Roosevelt, when running against Hoover, was complaining at the spending and the drive towards socialism yeah, that right. Hoover was doing. <laughs> when it's going to show in his numerous presidencies that he did that like to a massive multitude compared to Hoover. Yeah. It, were the American people so frightened at that time to just go with it or because they, if they vote him in against Hoover based upon what Roosevelt said at that time and Roosevelt yeah. comes and does it on a grander scale, why did they keep putting them there? Well, you know, I don't think that the American people in 1932 wanted uh, socialism or, or far bigger government, because mm -hmm. they did have another alternative. They could have voted for the Socialist Party candidate in 1932, mm -hmm. but they didn't. Uh, they voted for Roosevelt, who promised, in fact, this was in the Democratic Party national platform of 1932, he promised a 25% reduction in federal spending. Uh, he wanted to get the government off your back and out of your way because Hoover was uh, intervening in so many ways that obviously were, uh, weren't working. Uh, so the American people didn't want the socialism that FDR delivered or that uh, Hoover had given us as well. Uh, but I think, you know, we were in a national crisis. Many people thought, well, give him the benefit of the doubt. He's going to try something. And oh, my gosh, he gives such wonderful speeches. He's a silver tongued yeah. orator. He gives fireside chats that make us feel comfortable. And so let's give him a chance. So there was a lot of that feeling. Uh, and uh, Roosevelt was happy to cater to that. I suppose, because I'm just, I mean, he had what, like 
four terms. He didn't. I don't think he got to finish his last one out before he passed yeah, away. He, he only had a month of that uh, last right. term. But he would have had four four terms of just escalating government spending, more encroachment. Yeah. Everything that was promised, not only did he just fail to give it, he like went in the opposite direction. So I, yeah. I'm just... I'm just, my mind's just been wrapped around that. Like, how did they tolerate that then? Did, unless it was the crisis of the moment. Well, keep in mind his margins of victory uh, were never as great after 1932 as they were in that year. Uh, uh, they were being whittled, uh, whittled down. And then by 1940, with storm clouds on the horizon in Europe, and 44, when we were actually in the Second World War, a lot of people thought, well, we got to go with the horse that we know rather than the one that we don't. And I have to say, too, the Republicans, for the most part, uh, put up some pretty lousy candidates against him. <laughs> in 1936, uh, he might have been beaten, but uh, the Republicans nominated Alf Landon from Kansas. And not many people knew who he was. And uh, he was kind of Roosevelt light. He didn't, uh, he didn't say, I'm going to tear out this New Deal stuff root and branch. He just said, vote for me and I'll do pretty much the same thing. I'll just do it better. And uh, to the American people, that's that's no choice at all. Right. So the intervention, if you will, of uh, Roosevelt's growing bureaucracy in the managing yeah. of the economy, um, you're saying actually prolong the Great Depression. How yes. did that work out like that? Uh, in fact, in my essay, I cite uh, some economists, uh, two in particular, who've done an exhaustive study of this. And their conclusion is uh, that uh, Roosevelt prolonged the Great Depression by seven years. And that began uh, the, in the very first month or two that he took office in 1933 with the inauguration of the New Deal legislation. Uh, uh, part of that was the National Industrial Recovery Act, which imposed price controls on American industry. It um, attempted to raise uh, prices at a time when people were already uh, poor and struggling. Mm -hmm. uh, it tried to prevent competition uh, by forcing prices up. And then at the same time, he secured passage of the Agricultural Adjustment Act. And that used uh, a new tax on a sick economy, a new tax uh, to pay for the destruction of perfectly good fields of corn, wheat, and other crops and the perfectly healthy uh, herds of cattle, sheep, and pigs. Uh, it was ridiculous. And uh, the American economy did not recover under that uh, crazy legislation. It wasn't until the Supreme Court threw them both out uh, and other New Deal measures that it began to show some life until Roosevelt uh, crushed it again with a, a resumption of the Great Depression in 1937. Wow. I from the memories that have been shared with me, I've been told that the, the Great Depression was a time of um, limited food supply. Yeah. And, 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 and well, and during the war, rationing, of course, came on board. And, and you're telling me that they were levying tax money to purposely destroy food yeah. at a time in the Great Depression. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> what they thought, what the Roosevelt people thought was, well, if we reduce the supply of crops, then uh, that will raise the price and farmers will get more. Of course, they'll sell less. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, but then they thought, well, that will spread prosperity into ever widening circles. But of course, uh, you don't increase the prosperity of an economy by destroying things of value. Even if it had helped the farmers, it could have done so only at the expense of everybody else. Right. Uh, and it didn't help the farmer. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, that was their prescription for recovery. Remember, too, a big reason that farming was in such terrible straits was Hoover's uh, 1930 tariff, the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which uh, wiped out a big chunk of their overseas markets. So farmers were in desperate condition, uh, but the, that, was, that was because of previous federal interventions, which Roosevelt did little or nothing uh, to, to, to uh, try to overturn. <laughs> ah, I'm still... Because the history books from old are just messing with my head right now on, on everything. <laughs> it's, it's crazy. Um, <laughs> he has this long run of basically having a state-run economy almost. Price yeah. controls, items being destroyed, who you could trade or not trade with is just uh, grandly escalated. I, I wonder how we even got through the Great Depression then. <laughs> if, if it 
so the Supreme Court threw away some of those things and yes. it helped some, but he just came out with new stuff to pulverize the economy or something. I, I yeah, he sure did, including uh, new taxes. You know, when he ran against Hoover in 1932, he hit Hoover for having raised taxes. Hoover right. took the top. Hoover took the top income tax rate from 24 to 65 percent, and Roosevelt uh, decried that, said that was uh, confiscatory. We're going to roll that back. Well, he did just the opposite. Uh, before he's done, the top income tax rate will be 91 percent. And there was a time, believe it or not, uh, when Roosevelt proposed to Congress a 99 percent tax rate, top tax rate. Yeah. Uh, and the Congress refused to give it to him. A lot of the congressmen were from states that had their own state income taxes of two or three percent. And they thought, well, if he gets 99, how's my state going to get its two or three? So uh, uh, he came back. Just imagine this. I mean, this is the kind of environment mm. in which you, you, you want entrepreneurs to make investments. And yet this right. is what he does. He comes back and he says, OK, by executive order, I'm imposing a 100 percent income tax rate on all incomes over $25,000. Congress had to intervene and overturn that. But th this is the kind of mischief coming from the White House that did not inspire confidence and only drove investors uh, elsewhere, overseas, or into more sterile investments. Because this guy in the White House wanted to say, you take all the risk, and I'll take just about all the uh, profit that might come. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All of it. That's 100%. <laughs> That's yeah, crazy. Exactly. <laughs> Why would I want to give it to you? And uh, all the startup costs and the risk, like you said, that and th this is showing so, to me some very basic key principles of economics, of free economics, where no one wants to invest in an environment or start something new or expand what they have in an environment where you have no idea if tomorrow somebody's just going to yank it from you, yeah. or if they're going to if they're going to hem you in or cut off your marketing uh, reaches. Uh, raise your taxes, uh, tell you to destroy things by executive yeah. orders and things. Uh, you want to elaborate more on the effects of how government can actually inhibit a free economy from prospering rather than making it better? Okay. Yeah. You know, the best thing government can do if it will promote a prosperous economy is to provide for a fair field and no favors. Uh, keep the peace, but otherwise leave enterprising people alone. Don't penalize them for success. Don't vilify them for their uh, wealth creating potential. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet a lot of presidents have done that. Barack Obama said to entrepreneurs, you didn't build that, uh, you know, as if he had something to do with it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> right. So, but government can inhibit uh, uh, and does all the time economic growth. It does that by uh, stripping away incentives to create wealth, penalizing you if you succeed, uh, making the economic environment so uncertain that you just don't want to take a chance, uh, it, by introducing confiscatory measures, uh, over-regulation, making you jump through a million hoops, only one or two of which make any sense, and the rest are superfluous and simply empower bureaucracy. I mean, that's a way to crush an economy. There are lots of ways. Uh, also, by uh, Messing with the currency, uh, when the government uh, dilutes the, the uh, value of a currency, uh, it creates an artificial low interest situation. It may create a short term boom, but it just pumps up a bubble that will later have to be busted uh, at the expense of ordinary people and everybody. So uh, there are a lot of ways in which government can screw up an economy. And uh, over the decades, over the centuries, it's kind of made it a science. <laughs> it does it all the time. <laughs> yes, <laughs> a science. So uh, <laughs> there's something I'm, I'm seeing, at least where I'm at in, in North Carolina, there's a, it seems like a lot of businesses, and this is, I'm, I'm suspecting this is nation, national wide. The businesses apparently won't take any risk now unless there's some kind of grant involved or yeah. federal stimulus to kind of tempt them to expand somewhere. Otherwise, they'll just wait out on people's frustration who mm -hmm. then go to their government and say, you know, for example, you need to get Internet here or, or whatever other thing they want. Yeah. And of course, the the providers are just waiting until the government's like, okay, we'll help subsidize, bring it here so they can get credit for it, but yeah. then they don't have to invest their own pain and effort into it. 
it seems to me now that there's this mentality of unless the government spears at it, no one's going to lead it. I mean, yeah. do you see that? And if so, how devastating is that? Oh, yeah, I see it all the time. Can you imagine America ever being built into the powerhouse that it is in the first place, if that had been our thinking from the start? Right. Of course not. And we didn't sit on our butts waiting for politicians to give us something or do it for us. That's why we went from a poverty stricken uh, backwoods to a, an economic uh, engine, the envy of the world. Uh, and we have to restore that spirit. Uh, if we uh, succumb to the temptation to just wait until the government does it for us or gives it to us, uh, we're actually repeating the mistakes that led to the demise of one civilization after another, at least as far back as uh, that of ancient Rome. But remember, the government doesn't have anything to give anybody except what it first takes from somebody. It's not yeah. some fountain of free, free goodies, you know, that, oh, look, it just comes out of nowhere. Uh, <laughs> it, it just redistributes and keeps a big portion of, uh, of the loot uh, to run its own operation. Uh, that's, that's really what it reduces to. Uh, how people right. think that's somehow a stimulus is beyond me. <laughs> so, so, yeah, we have to get away from that. Uh, but, but, you know, that's what our schools teach overwhelmingly. Government right. schools teach that more government is the answer. What would you expect? Right. Uh, yeah, it's unfortunate. That, that sounds like another essay in the making there, uh, government looting <laughs> operations. Uh, yeah, I think, you know, I think I've written about that, but it's probably time for another one. Yeah, I know, right, a remake of it. So <laughs> I hope you're enjoying today's episode. If you really like Raise of the Age, we will encourage you to leave a review on the platform that you're listening to, but especially if you would like a copy of my book, Not in the Wind, Earthquake, or Fire, which is a first-hand account of of my second deployment to Iraq, and it's filled with many spiritual insights, I'm going to give away 10 copies for free. And every week I will give out a copy for someone who leaves a review of this podcast. You can do that by going to Twitter, write your review, and then hashtag it Rage of the Age Now. Or you can go to Facebook, find our page, Rage of the Age, click the reviews, recommend us, and then write in your review. I hope next week to give away a copy of Not in the Wind, Earthquake of Fire to someone who leaves a review. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. Uh, the, the thing is to me, is first off, the government does not like anything new. Yeah, uh, because, uh, you know, it wants to be in charge. It wants to be right. in charge of stuff. Yeah, and, and so if we wait for them to spearhead anything new or innovative or creative or can grow, government's not going to be the entity that does it. They just sit and wait, watch, and go, hey, there's something, and then their looting kicks in, and they yeah. take what's theirs. It's crazy. Absolutely. Yeah. And isn't it, isn't it entirely predictable? When you think of... Uh, dynamic innovation, entrepreneurship, wealth mm -hmm. creation, exciting dynamic forces uh, in the economy that are serving consumers. You don't think of the Department of Motor Vehicles. You think of uh, risk-taking private entrepreneurs who sometimes mm -hmm. fail, sometimes succeed. Right. But they are the, uh, the powerhouse uh, at the core of uh, the creativity of the American economy. I can almost imagine that if the government had to spearhead every advance or new creation, new, new whatever, we'd still be using carbon copies for <laughs> making <laughs> it's what they got. They've invested in it. They've got the whole tax base wrapped around the carbon copy thing. And we'd still yeah. be using that. I mean, if it wasn't for others going, hey, let's try a fax machine, which they're still using, by the way, and it's out of date. Yeah. Ex <laughs> exactly. Know? Or let's try email, let's try a scan. You know, it, <laughs> we would still be back with carbon copies, I think. Oh, oh, my gosh. And that story has been, or that lesson has been repeated and provided endlessly in American history. Just think back to the Wright brothers in right. 1903. I mean, there was a guy named Samuel Langley uh, who was uh, he, the beneficiary of about $2 million in, in government money to try to come up with a, a flying machine, okay? And he created one after another that just flopped into the Potomac. <laughs> meantime, 
<laughs> two guys, two bicycle mechanics from Dayton, Ohio, on their own nickel, right? And actually get the job done and without a penny of taxpayer expense. Well, I can imagine they wouldn't have to deal with like the the regs and and, and inspections and the the carbon will then have been handwritten or typed or whatever <laughs> copies that you had right. to send to every entity, paying dues and fees <laughs> and uh, getting permits and. Oh my goodness, that would it would never happen, I imagine. But I, I no. think of other things, uh, of how, like you said, how our nation had grown into the powerhouse that it became. Can you imagine if we waited on the government to put out the rail? If we yeah. waited for them to create steel mills? If we waited for them to do the oil fields or the the create the automobile? It probably would have never ever happened. Well, you know, uh, you mentioned the rails. I'm sure there are people out there because of what the schools have told them who, right. who would probably think, uh, oh, but didn't the government build the transcontinental railroads or weren't they responsible for them? What their teachers probably didn't tell them is that, yeah, there were government subsidies in land and cash to right. railroads to build uh, to the West Coast, three of them. But all three of those uh, uh Transcontinental railroads went bankrupt multiple times. The track had to be re rebuilt uh, to make it usable because they were just throwing the tracks down to get the government subsidy. But there was a guy at the same time, uh, yeah. or shortly thereafter, named James J. Hill, who built a transcontinental all the way from St. Paul, Minnesota to Seattle without taking a penny of government subsidy. Right. He made money off of it, never went bankrupt. It's still operating to this day. So, Still operating to this day. Yeah, yeah wow. under the name Burlington Northern, but it was the Great Northern Railroad under James J. Hill. Well, that that shows you the effect, I think, that government has in open markets is when there's money available from the government, it's almost like people will put on a show of what we're doing with it to get mm -hmm. it and not even have to make <laughs> it work. It oh, just, yeah. It completely changes the incentives. Uh, you yes. go for the cash, uh, not, you know, what's the best use of this amount of money because I don't mm. want to lose any of it. I'd right. like to make something off of it. Right. But instead, if the cash is just dangling in front of you, free stuff, yeah, it changes your behavior and not in the right direction. I mean, I would even say it's affected uh, charity work in, in a way because yeah. I've seen this firsthand uh, having been a veteran and I would go to these different organizations that promise this, that, and the other. and all they would do is refer me back to the VA, the one place I was trying to avoid going through. Mm -hmm. and, and But they were getting <laughs> money to exist just to refer me back to the VA who I didn't want to go through in the first place. And it was like, there's more money wasted. Just give That's me what right. you gave this charity. I mean, it was crazy. And, and how many people have even learned from the experience of the VA? I mean, you yes. have a, half the country that uh, is endorsing, you know, government takeover of, oh, of healthcare. What there is yeah. that's still private, and yet uh, you'd think they'd ask, well, let's first find out how well they've done with what they've already done in healthcare. And if they did that, they'd, they'd discover how how disastrous the VA has been. How many veterans have wanted to escape it, mm -hmm. and they'd also learn about how uh, Medicare and Medicaid are both staring bankruptcy in the face in a little more than a decade. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, it's like if I came up to you, uh, Philip, on the street as a stranger and I said, hey, you know, uh, I, I, I'd like to make an offer to you. I'd like to take charge of your retirement. Uh, yeah, put me in charge of your retirement. But here's something about my background you might want to know. Uh, <laughs> I'm so up to my eyeballs in red ink, I don't know how I'm ever going to get out. Everything I touch, I've somehow managed to ruin. I can't tell a plus sign from a minus sign, but hey, put me in charge of your retirement. <laughs> Would you say, oh, okay. Uh, no, I, I wouldn't. And I guess that's why the government says, well, I'm in charge. <laughs> you know? That's right. Whether you like it or but, not. Right. Because otherwise you wouldn't, you would not hire them as your accountant. That's just the truth. Oh my gosh. I, I can't think of very many people in government I would hire for anything. I mean, government is what you go to if you can't do much else, I think, in many cases. I mean, there are good people in government, don't get me wrong. Sure. But by and large, the people who uh, don't know how to actually create wealth, they look for employment in operations that just take it and redistribute it. Now, now looking at the Great Depression again, and this I did know because it was, it was taught in my, in my school books, there were other depressions 
prior to the Great Depression, but they didn't last nearly as long. So how long did those last and why did we bounce out of them quicker? Well, the Great Depression lasted, uh, I argue in my essay, uh, 16 years. Wow. It didn't. uh, Some people say, oh, but it ended in 1941 with American entry into World War II. Well, only by the measure of unemployment and only because we drafted 11 million men and sent them overseas. <laughs> yes. Or they, they didn't count in the unemployment. <laughs> but the, the average standard of living did not change. If, uh, if anything, it, it declined during the yes. war years. We didn't get a genuine uh, recovery till after the war. So it, that's 1929 to 1945. That's 16 years. Wow. The previous longest depression was only four. Uh, and most of them uh, lasted uh, much less than that. In fact, we had a sharp depression in 1921-22, which was uh, a reaction to the inflation uh, to pay for World War One, all the government interventions there. But that one was quick and over in a matter of months uh, because the government, for, for change, did the right thing. It cut its spending. It cut its uh, borrowing, uh, began reducing the national debt. It didn't pile on the regulations. Uh, and uh, as a result, the depression, which was a readjustment, you might say, uh, mm-hmm. was very, very brief. All the previous ones were brief by comparison to the Great Depression as well. Right. So and those other depressions, I would imagine it's not like they had, say, two to four years of solid depression. It was a variation going through it and then kind of coming up again. So it's not like it was yeah. just absolute depression for that entire length of time, right? It was like an adjustment. No, that's right. That's yeah. right. And different parts of the country recovered more quickly than others. Right. But uh, another important thing to remember about all those previous depressions was that they were all preceded by government uh, mismanagement of the money supply. And we had a big one in the 19, uh, 1890s. Uh, mm. that, uh, it was my specialty of my uh, master's dissertation. And uh, uh, the government had been subsidizing silver and printing paper money, uh, and all that came crashing to a halt in 1893. And it wasn't until Grover Cleveland, one of our best presidents, straightened things out uh, that uh, we finally saw recovery. But that was all caused by government intervention before the Depression ever happened. Right. Now, have we had a Depression since the Great Depression? Uh, well, you know, there's no firm definition of depression. Some economists okay. say, well, if you got unemployment over 10%, that's a depression. Others say, no, no, it's something worse than that. Uh, you could argue that the 2008, 2009 period was as close to the Great Depression as we've come. Maybe, you know, depending on your definition, you might say it was a depression, but it was nothing uh, like uh, the unemployment, nearly 30% uh, during the Great Depression. Right. Well, and that was, um, I, I guess I'm trying to reason according to the normal business cycle where depression is actually a part of the business cycle naturally until yeah. it readjusts itself again. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, cause I'm thinking in my mind, uh, like you're saying, certain political mindsets are going to be like, we, since the great depression, because government has fixed everything, we don't have depressions anymore. Cause I think I've been taught that too, by the way, they, they cut it off at the pass and stop mm-hmm. it from escalating. And, and I don't, I don't know. Cause like they call it like the, you're talking about the recession in 2008 or whatever. And they called it the great recession. I'm like, yeah. if, is it a reset? If it's that great, why is it not called a depression? Like, are you afraid to admit <laughs> it's a depression or, yeah. or is it worse than a recession, but not a depression? I mean, how does this well, work? <laughs> the folks who put, the folks who put their faith in, in government and its uh, central bank and its monetary authorities, you know, they, they often play with uh, the vocabulary to make mm. their handiwork look better. But uh, the fact is, since the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, uh, we, one of its tasks, supposedly, that's what we were sold on, was to iron out the business cycle. And yet right. the business cycle has been more pronounced under the, the Federal Reserve than it ever was before. Mm. Uh, it's given us a Great Depression, a uh, Great Recession, and another six or eight recessions in between, a currency that it was supposed to protect the value of, but it's worth about a nickel of what it was when they started. It's been a manifest failure. Um, so uh, I wish we could get people to, to assess history accurately. but. 
they, it's hard to do if your historians are biased and they're all aiming at the uh, trying to convince you that more government is uh, somehow uh, our savior. Well, yeah, I can definitely agree with that. So the Federal Reserve, it being started in 1913, then was meant to, I guess, balance out the cycles like we're talking about. Based upon observing the economic track record since then, you're saying that they have they have failed in that. It didn't accomplish what it was supposed to. And do you think we'll be better without it or does it need re revamp somehow? Uh, in 1990, I was uh, at Milton Friedman's birthday party at the White House, would you believe, when George Bush uh, <laughs> wow. was where it was. Was that 1990? No, that was 2000. 2000, sorry, the second Bush. That was and, during the uh, filming of uh, Magna Carta, by the way. Oh, maybe so. <laughs> yeah, that, that no. I don't remember. <laughs> but it was at that meeting that uh, the uh, Federal Reserve Chairman at that time, Ben Bernanke, actually turned to Friedman and admitted that the Fed was the cause of the Great Depression. But then he went on to say, but we won't do that again. We've learned. Thank you for helping to teach us. Uh, so that was a rare moment of where even the highest official at the Fed admitted uh, what they had done. But that's not something you'll read in the typical history book that's presented right. as if, oh, it's these wonderful people who are smart and they're, they're, they're ironing out the business cycle for us. They're public servants and blah, 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 blah. They're doing all these wonderful things. That's, that's just pure state worship uh, as opposed to actual history. But that's what we're afflicted with in the universities and K-12 education all too mm. often. State worship, that's an interesting way to put it. Uh, all that's missing is incense to Caesar, and we got it all set, right? I mean, <laughs> yeah, well, that's probably, that may be coming. Don't give them any coming. ideas. <laughs> I know. You don't, don't let that get out or anything. They're always looking for a new angle for their <laughs> looting operation. <laughs> yeah, you got it. <laughs> so so uh, based on what we're talking about then, I just couldn't help but think about this uh, COVID-19 pandemic and the initial reaction, which I think the vast majority of people were sold to was stimulus money, intervening, trying to kickstart the economy to ride out the wave. Is, is, do you think that was a mistake or maybe they could have done it differently? Because this sounds just like what we're talking about. The government's like, we'll come in, we'll rescue you, the economy, and we'll fix everything, which in my humble opinion, they've broke more than they fixed during this time frame. Yeah, but yeah. Do, do you think the stimulus was a good idea for that? Well, you know, first of all, it's sure uh, a powerful testimony to what people can be convinced to support uh, in the uh, midst of a crisis. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a year ago, if you had just said, hey, everybody, the pre-pandemic, if you had right. said, hey, let's just let's spend another three trillion dollars that we don't have. And and go into debt by that much so that uh, your grandkids will be up to their eyeballs in, in paying it off. Uh, and let's just throw money around. Every, almost everybody would say, what? You're crazy. But then you change the situation. You've got a crisis. People say, well, OK, it sounds good. I think the, uh, uh, the best assessment of the wisdom or lack thereof of the stimulus and the lockdowns and so forth is not going to come while all this is still uh, going on. It's going to come with a little bit of historical hindsight, right. maybe in a, another year or two. But it's beginning to shape up in my mind already as largely a mistake. The lockdowns in particular, uh, increasingly, it appears that they may have done very little and in some ways have been counterproductive to stop the spread of, of COVID. Uh, they may have simply prevented uh, uh, large scale immunity from taking place and delayed uh, COVID rather than uh, uh, cut it back. But time will tell. But I think we'll look back and say, wow, how are we ever going to pay this off? Uh, so I, I'm giving you a kind of tentative response because I just don't think a final, conclusive, and total answer is available yet until we actually look back. But I suspect that a lot of the eternal principles I've been convinced of for a long time uh, still hold that government. Uh, Spending is not an answer, that uh, mandates and things like lockdowns forcing you to close your business usually produces more harm than good. And I think that's what the evidence ultimately is going to show. Yeah, I, I believe you're right. Uh, all I know is when the stimulus came out, you had, uh, I know numerous business owners who applied for the you know, payroll protection uh, program or to pay their employees and, and all these other mm -hmm. things, and none of them got it. 
And, oh, and yeah. all the bank, all the bank applications were just overwhelmed. The the money, like with like the minute the money hit the banks from the government, it was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, it, and, it, it, and it's hard to blame them for even applying because after right. all, it was it was the government that effectively shut them down. So I exactly. have some sympathy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the money that it was meant to sustain them during the shutdown that the government made them do, yeah. but then they didn't get the promise, and yet we're still on the hook for the price tag to pay mm -hmm. this off. Surprise, surprise. You know, yeah. I mean, how many, yeah. Can you think of any other time in history where the promises of government uh, didn't come to pass? I mean, that's uh, well, a few might thing. come to mind. I mean, <laughs> a few of them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's the most most recurring oh, thing in history. <laughs> well, Lawrence, I tell you, what, it's, it's been a pleasure <laughs> talking with you today uh, about this topic. Um, I think, well, for me, it's only just scratched the surface because I've been damaged from public education for years, I think, on um, how to think <laughs> about economics and, and the role of government. And it's just it's just geared. I mean, the government runs the schools and they have basically geared the schools to teach people government's your friend and will solve every problem yeah. and to take away every initiative to help yourself. I think it's very destructive. But reading your essay, uh, Great Myths of the Great Depression was uh, was an eye opener to me. Yes, and and you can find that on uh, we can find that on fee.org, right? Is that where that's it's right? Located? Yes, uh -huh. right. in the in the store. Yeah, scroll down to the bottom of the main page and go to uh, I think it's a store or bookstore or something like that. Right, and and the, and you have other essays written there, and that, and that org that uh, fee.org has a a whole bunch of material that you can look through and educate yes. yourself about. You know, how economics actually works and how the government kind of makes it unwork <laughs> in the process. Yep. And uh, yep. I definitely recommend uh, you listening, uh, check that site out, check out the works of uh, Lawrence Reed and what he's written or, or he likes to go by Larry, I guess he says you go by Larry. And I, and I do have a website of my own too, uh, Philip, it's uh, lawrencewreed.com. Okay. And, and what do you have at that location? Uh, everything I've ever written for fee okay. and a, spr a sprinkling of other things and quotes and lectures and quite a lot. Do, do you have any other books or works uh, in the upcoming future? Uh, I'm still trying to decide what the next next book topic will be, but I have a gee, probably a list of 20 or more ideas for articles. I'm writing okay. articles all the time, but I haven't settled on another book yet. Uh, I think American looting operation or government looting operation <laughs> sounds pretty catchy to me. but. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot of people might say, what else is new? <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, well, Lawrence, it's been a real pleasure having you today. My pleasure. Thank you, Philip. I want to take a quick opportunity to give a shout out to two podcasts that I want to recommend that you listen to. The first one, of course, is the Gary Wilkerson podcast, which is a podcast of the guests that you're listening to today for today's program. The Gary Wilkerson podcast you can find it at worldchallenge.org, and he's currently doing a series on the attributes of God. I highly recommend that you go there and listen to it yourself. I also want to highlight for you Veterans Rant, Rattle, and Roll, with the emphasis on stopping the average of 22 suicides that take place on a daily basis. And the whole aspect of the show is to have veterans come on, uh, rant, rattle, and roll, and talk about their lives and everything that's going on, and of course, to emphasize to others to not take your own life. Again, the Gary Wilkerson podcast and the veterans rant, rattle, and roll. You're listening to Rage of the Age. Rage of the Age. Politics, religion, economics, and history with a conservative bend. For this essay segment, I would like to compare two competing paradigms. And this has to do with the aspect of the state. The first viewpoint regarding the state is um, sort of how we explained in the talk with Lawrence today, or Larry, where we mentioned the term uh, state worship. And it's sort of like that in a way for some people who view the state in this sort of revered thing. So you have that side of the paradigm where the state is highly prized, valued, maybe even worshipped. And it's expected to 
take more of a lead in a lot of things in life because of the reverence given to it. But then you have the opposite paradigm where the state is not meant to be revered to that regard, that it has certain roles, but it's to have a limited role, especially when it comes to the realm of economics. So let's look at these two paradigms and compare them together. The first one, where the, the government basically runs economies. Now, this can be taken in a variety of different approaches. There's no one way that this is done. So when, when you hear that, don't assume it's automatically you know, state-run communism, though that is a version of this. There are other aspects that this applies to that it's, it's basically the mindset to which I'm addressing, that the government has to fix this. The government has to run that. The government should make this happen and improve the economy, et cetera, et cetera. It's that mindset. So, but in that mindset, it, it's just that, that the state must take the lead in making things happen for economic progress. To give you a few historical examples of how that might look, and then to maybe emphasize how that might look today for those who are proponents of this type of uh, mindset, if you will, is, well, if you look at one of the most ancient examples, uh, you have ancient Egypt. Now, of course, before that, you had uh, the Samaritans and other group peoples who were very considered centralized, if you will, in, in how they would, they would have state-run economies based upon a temple complex uh, corvée labor to work the lands publicly and to do other functions and buildings. And this was all coordinated by kings and leaders, maybe priests. And it's quite impressive when you, when you study it in, in uh, the field of archaeology and history and whatnot. It's pretty neat how these ancient people would organize themselves to craft out a civilization in the areas that they were. And of course, it was based upon this mindset of the more centralized control you have, the better prosperity that there is. Of course, this mentality was um, greatly expanded under the ancient Egyptians, where the pharaoh was considered God, God on earth himself. There was a, a, a fight within Egypt from the lower leaders until finally, you know, you had a unified crown with a pharaoh to rule over them all. And then, of course, the idea is, is since that happened, there was this massive explosion of... Um, the Egyptian culture, its growth, its empire, its, its uh, ability to produce things and, and, and all that sort of thing is definitely an example uh, of this type of approach. When we look at Rome, you have this same idea, uh, especially when the Roman emperors came along. More and more, the person of the emperor was viewed as the person who's basically the savior of the empire to such an extent that they had their own imperial cult to pay what was called the cultus to the genius of the emperor. Uh, this, this spirit behind him, this divine force working through him, and, and cultus is uh, where we get the word cult from. This is it's sort of like a worship. It's where you, you pay your dues, respect to something divine. You would burn the incense to the, the emperor uh, you know, to pay homage to this genius that's operating in him. And this is supposed to be some kind of sign of loyalty. And of course, if everyone's on board with this one governing entity, then the idea was is there'll, there'll be peace and prosperity throughout the land. In the medieval times, you had a common phrase that went something like this, that the face of the master was good upon the land. Now, I kind of like that phrase actually as a leadership principle because there's nothing more annoying than someone that thinks they're the leader and in charge, but they're never around and never solve anything and don't address issues. So when it comes to the, the philosophy of leadership, I like that statement, but it was meant more as an economic statement because the masters are the ones who said what got planted, what fields were made fallow, uh, where to put the livestock you know, which trees were to be cut down. It was their property, it was their land. They owned it all, so they decided what happened to it, and everybody else's economy kind of revolved around their decisions. So the presence of the master was kind of necessary to make everything function in a prosperous manner. 
And you have the example, of course, from uh, the English Civil War. They even had a song uh, called Until the King Enjoys His Own Again. Uh, they cut off the head of that king and then not long afterward went back in the restoration and established a king yet again because they didn't know what else to do. They really had this mindset that unless there's a king sitting there, nothing's going to be right and everything's going to be out of disorder and the kingdom's not going to be run well. We have to have this centralized authority upon which uh, to focus. Of course, later theories that would develop that I've mentioned are of socialism and communism. These aren't really new ideas that kind of popped out of nowhere. They're ancient themes that have continued through human existence. And the idea is, is that you have this, this power that's stronger than everybody else that makes everybody behave the way they should, and that the money is spent on things that have to be spent to avoid you know, uh, the, the fighting over it or... People don't want to give it up or share it or whatnot. So you kind of just, you know, as the expression goes, if you want to make a, an omelet, you break a few eggs. And these powerful entities, these states, these, the state worship is meant to be like in love with that idea that things won't happen unless the government makes people do it and act right. And when they do that, there will be peace and prosperity in the land. And then they can, they can decide these big economic uh, moves that they can take that no one else would do. And, and it would then like kickstart uh, the economy. This is sort of that kind of a paradigm. But let's look at it from the other paradigm. Where you have those who don't worship the state. You have those maybe who despise the idea of a state. Uh, an anarchist sort of fall, uh, falls in this category. I'm not an anarchist, uh, but I'm just giving that as an example that uh, you, you have the opposite end of the spectrum where there are those who want absolutely no government whatsoever of any kind uh, on the other side of the spectrum. But generally, you, you have a vein of people who want less government interference in the economy they don't worship the state. They don't believe that they have to have this overriding power to do these things in order for everyone to prosper. Now, that doesn't mean they don't see a need for government. It doesn't mean that they don't agree that the government has certain functions to do in order to provide a proper grounding for prosperity to take place. It's just a disagreement of, how much power they have to exercise in order to accomplish that goal. I mean, one of the goals of the government of our constitutional republic, of course, is to provide for the welfare of the nation, to make things kind of common, to provide the common bedrock foundations and uh, workings in between the different states and the places around the country to where a common understanding can be uh, created and regulated to some degree to allow for that prosperity to take place. So there is a role for government that many with this philosophy believe in. They just don't believe that it has to all be initiated by the state in every economic action that is taken. This viewpoint believes in individual in ingenuity. It believes in entrepreneurship. It believes in a freer and open market in which to earn things for your own benefit. It doesn't believe the state should come in and take what prosperous people create and do something else with it for the, under the guise of improving the economy or improving people's conditions. Like we've mentioned in an interview, destroying people's wealth and taking things from them is no way to build prosperity. It really isn't. But in essence, that's really the two paradigms that are at war with each other at times. Uh, and still, in our society today, this is still a conflict. Where do you put that line between we need the federal government to make this happen but, and versus the federal government needs to keep its nose out of it? There's a spectrum in between there. People line up along that on different uh, parts of it, obviously. The difficulty comes in where to put yourself in that spectrum. But I, I would like to caution those listening to not 
fall for the worship of the state. Now, I know when I say that, everybody, you, know, you may be thinking, well, I don't worship the state. I just believe this, that, and the other. Um, but I, I emphasize that term, worship the state, because it's like there's this whole idea around, like, if it doesn't exist and we don't honor it, respect it, and love it, and, well, worship it. Give it its cultus, if you will, its due reverence, respect, and adoration, that everything will collapse. But oftentimes, it's that interference that causes trouble. We talked about some of those things in the interview today. We talked about some of the myths of the Great Depression. And a lot of the troubles were caused by the government themselves. I think any honest, open, and fair investigation will demonstrate that our government, time and time again, has caused problems when it came in with a heavy fist to fix something, usually economic, and somehow that was supposed to make everything work just fine and spread prosperity, and yet all it did was create even more problems in the process. And yet, we see by example otherwise, when people have been left alone to just prosper on their own, they did just that. This, this nation is amazing in the scheme of history because so many innovations and inventions and the birthing of different ideas and, and ways of looking at things and problem solving, our ability to problem solve even, by comparison to the history of the world, is absolutely astounding. And certainly I believe that reason is because of a concept of we don't have to wait for the government to do that. The government is a third-party purchaser, meaning they take other people's money that's not theirs and then they throw it at other things, seeing if it will make a benefit. There's no risk on their part because they get the money from somebody else. They don't necessarily uh, put themselves in league with what you're trying to accomplish. They may not. They join different things in which to pay for based upon, well, votes, scandals, kickbacks, funders who funded them in their campaign. It, there's all these things that add up, and the next thing you know, this money's all gone somewhere, and what good did it do? I mean, there's entire industries and entities that exist right now just to take government money, and they honestly provide very little in service or product, and that's just the truth. Whereas there have been many innovations that have been started by people just with an idea, and an idea that they wanted to see come true. And they took the risk. They made forth the effort. It was their passion. They're a first-party purchaser. It's their money. It's their passion. It's their dream. And they pursued it, and they made it happen. The government probably avoided it the entire time because there was risk involved. But the minute it succeeds, who comes behind? Well, we need to regulate this, and we need to add this tax, and we need to make sure this is fair and that's fair. And they, and they put no skin in the game until there was money to be taken from it. We see this time and time again. The role of government should be limited. It should be to, as I think the scripture tells us, the government exists to reward those who do good and to punish those who do evil. That's the very basis of what the role of government is meant to be. It's not meant to tell you how to earn your money. It's not meant to take your money and just give it to somebody else arbitrarily to buy favors. It's not meant to stifle economic progress. It's not meant to keep rearranging things around to where there's no certainty of what you're going to do. That's their step. That's what they do. And they have no shame in it. You've been listening to Rage of the Age. If you love today's podcast, make sure to leave a review on the media you're listening through. Secure future episodes by heading over to rageoftheage.com and clicking the RSS feed button. Until next time, this has been Rage of the Age.